Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of our Impact International Safety Calls. I want to thank you for being here with us. Uh, we've got a great panel of experts to join us here this morning. When we had the idea to start this call, and we, it was really a regional safety call we did, one of the things we wanted to do was keep it very timely and very pertinent to what's going on in our industry and within the ironworking industry. Obviously, at that time, we had no idea that uh, the whole world will be battling what's become the COVID-19 pandemic, um, not only as in our industry, but everyone, everyone across the, the globe. So it's changed every facet of our lives, um, everything we do, how we go about just our day-to-day -day interactions as a community. So um, one of the things I want to do before we start is just remind everybody to be in prayer and support for everybody out there who either has this disease, uh, those that, that are in the hospital battling it. Sadly, many have already lost their lives, but that we remember the, the nurses and the doctors out there in the front lines uh, that are fighting this battle for us every day. Um, so today, what we're going to be discussing is how we can keep employees and ourselves safe on job sites and from the job sites to home. And when we do have to vent venture out, how we can do that and do that safely. I know there's a lot of questions out there, a lot of confusion, I think, for everyone. So we're going to try and give some answers there today on, on really battling COVID-19, understanding what it is, and how we uh, can help break this cycle. Um, and we know one of the things is we can do is just stop the spread. So with that, our first guest speaker is uh, General President of the Iron Workers, Eric Dean. Um, Eric uh, has some things he wants to share with us. And there's Eric. We're going to make sure he's unmuted. Good morning, Eric. How are you today? Good morning, Pete. How are you? Doing well. Thank you, sir. So, um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you, and the floor is yours. Before anyone makes any uh, witty comments, I am in my basement. My daughter and her husband decorated it. I'm not in Wayne World's, uh, Wayne's World. Those are rock posters behind me, so bear with me as I work from home. Um, to all of you who joined the call, I thank you for taking the uh, safety of our members, whether you're a contractor and they're your employees or you're a labor leader and they're your members. Those are our brothers and sisters and that's all humankind. And I couldn't echo what uh, Pete's comments were about the first frontline people that are first responders that are taking care of our sick and infirm. So recently, I sent out a letter to our members and our leaders that talked about what the international's doing. You know, we're, we, we've implemented a telework from home. We have a minimal skeleton crew that takes the mail and disseminates it to our employees. Um, and we have to care for our members. We have to care for the unemployed. So we advocated to the governments to make sure that there was a uh, uninterruption of uh, unemployment benefits. Unemployment is not gonna be a uh, a backstop for wages, but it's going to keep the wolf from the door. So we had to worry about the people who are unemployed, that they would be getting some kind of compensation from the government and that it get fast track. We succeeded in the U.S. on that side. On the Canadian side, we have assurances that there's going to be a uh, extended period for people to receive unemployment benefits. We're hoping this doesn't last too long, but in the interim, we all have another safety concern, and that is for our members who are deemed essential, when they go to work, how do we make sure that there's a unilateral enforcement of safety provisions that are consistent? The government guidelines and with the industry uh, recommended practices. And there's a variant of that. And some people are dismissive, cavalier, doesn't think it applies to them. My concern is for every member who is required to work that they be provided a safe work environment and that the unions look after the workers' concerns and that the employers adhere to the government recommendations for social distancing and the protocols. We're going to hear from some experts here going on, but I want to let you know that uh, the union uh, has advocated a couple other measures. We are asking the government to look at, with the collapse of the equity market, some kind of multi-employer pension relief. But more importantly, I'm really scared and concerned about our welfare plans. I'm worried about the downward pressure of uh, having probably half our membership, if not more, not contributing. 
and then the downward pressure that that's going to take out of the welfare plan. So we're looking for some COBRA type of extension in the U.S. that allows for the continuity of basic medical services. And then the number one area of concern for us is the long-term security for work. And both the Canadian government and the U.S. government are working on plans to do long-term infrastructure. And I think what's going to happen here is you're going to see a softening of the private sector spending. We're going to come Eventually, we're going to go back to work, and we're going to complete the work that's in process, which there's an abundance of it. We're doing 9 and 10 million man hours a month as an organization of field construction work, in addition to the shop work. So we're going to return to that work. But when we return to that work, we're not so sure that new projects are going to be on the horizon, and we're looking for robust infrastructure and transportation. So... Uh, that's something that we've ad advocated for a long period of time, but we're looking for the long-term financial health of our organization and our members. We're looking for the short-term um, financial health of the unemployed. We're looking for assistance for our trust funds, for our contributing employers that sit on those funds and manage those jointly uh, trusted money. And then we're also looking for the immediate safety of our members, whether they're at home protecting their families or on the job site. And I can't encourage the contractors enough to please make sure our members are safe. I can't en encourage the iron workers that are on the call to stay safe and keep your family safe. You do not want to bring this back unintended on your family or loved ones. And I would ask that labor leaders work in a practical manner with the contractors to make sure that these protocols are in place and that we address the members' concerns and we work with the employers to make sure we get our work done safe. Thank you for having these calls. These monthly calls have been very interesting. We have over 800 people last time I checked that were served for this call. This, this is a big interest and this is a, a world issue that hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. And just thank you for being involved and being interested in our member safety and all those that are going to add to the lofty uh, educational piece that are going to speak next. So thanks a lot, uh, Pete, and uh, I want you all to stay safe. Thank you, Eric, for your time. Uh, I know, thank you for your leadership and what uh, is certainly unprecedented in our lifetimes. Um, and uh, I know there's a lot more of that going to be needed. You're busy, but again, thanks for your time and your words, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. So uh, with that, our next uh, speaker is going to be uh, for the iron workers, Steve Rank, Director of Safety. Um, and before Steve starts and introduces uh, some of our guest speakers, I want to remind everybody um, of our topics today. We're really going to be addressing COVID-19, what it is, how does it spread, what's essential work, how we keep iron workers and, and everyone safe, what to do if you're sick, things of that nature. What we're not going to cover, <clears throat> and I know there's a lot of confusion out there in these things, but this thing like the CARES Act and other bills in front of Congress, layoffs, furloughs, unemployment, work comp issues, CBA, collective bargaining issues, those are the things that we're really not going to be covering today. And uh, what we're going to ask is that we save all questions and answer, and we're going to have plenty of time for that for the end of our speakers. So um, I just want to remind everybody of that. That's the format we're going to use going forward. So just save those till the end. And uh, Steve, thank you for your time. It's good to see you. And uh, please uh, go ahead and take the floor. Thank you, Pete. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, our general president, Eric Dean, taking a few minutes out of his busy schedule to give us some assurance that he's addressing this, this epidemic at many levels that affect our members and our contractors throughout North America. So we appreciate everything that he's doing as well as our general officers back in Washington to make sure that our organization runs smoothly for our members as much as possible. Uh, today we are really pleased to have two people with us uh, online. Uh, we're going to address this issue from a medical standpoint. And doing that today, we have, we're very fortunate to have Dr. John Howard. John is the, the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for the United States Department of Health and Human Services. 
John is not only a medical doctor, but John is also an attorney. And he also carries three or four other MBAs and in, in a master's in MBA in business and everything else. So John is very, very qualified to address this issue from many different angles, from a medical standpoint, from a business regulatory standpoint. So we really take, appreciate uh, Dr. Howard taking his time to address us today. I have to tell you, he's in very high demand being the director of NIOSH and for him to uh, take time out of his day uh, to address our uh, thousand plus people across the United States and Canada is very, very much appreciated. On the other half of this, uh, we have uh, Mr. Lynn Welsh that will be on later. And Lynn is going to address a lot of issues that come up from a day-to-day -day standpoint uh, regarding what's going on on the job site. What about regulatory issues? What about contractor issues? What about the top 25 questions that we have received in the last three weeks? And the safety department, meaning Wayne Cressup, who's a district rep uh, in the Iron Workers International Safety Department, he's online today. We also have Jeff Norris, the Canadian safety coordinator that handles all the safety and health matters all the way across Canada. So I can assure you that both Wayne and Jeff will be uh, working alongside of us um, through headquarters and through their uh, efforts to get information to our members and our contractors. So I would like to uh, now for Dr. John Howard to take over and share with us information. And as Pete said, please save your questions till the very end. I know that you have some very important questions for Dr. Howard uh, and Lynn Welsh. Uh, so they'll be glad to answer those. So everyone, please welcome Dr. John Howard. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, we're going to show you some slides, um, and uh, I'm going to ask Pete to be my uh, slide projectionist, and I thank him for that. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what's called SARS, uh, Coronavirus 2, and the workplace. Uh, uh, please, the next slide. First, we're going to start with some naming. You know, this is a little confusing because we hear both of these terms. COVID-19 is an abbreviation. The CO stands for Corona. The VI stands for virus. D stands for disease. And the 19 refers to the end of 2019 when the viral disease was first identified in December. So remember, COVID-19 stands for when you get sick with the virus. But the actual name of the virus is referred to as SARS coronavirus 2. And that stands for severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. Please, next slide, Pete. Thank you. So this coronavirus family uh, is, uh, is a small one. Um, there are only about seven members that cause disease in humans. It causes disease in a lot of animal species, but the human disease is SARS coronavirus 1, which some of you remember in the early 2000s, we had an outbreak of this coronavirus. Um, we had about 8,000 cases at that time with about 800 deaths. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 is this new virus that has just entered the human population. The third member is called MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Some of you remember uh, this uh, outbreak occurring primarily in the Middle East uh, associated uh, with, uh, with transmission from uh, camels. Then there are a number, four different strains of coronaviruses that have been around quite a while and they cause the common cold. They do not cause uh, severe disease. Next slide, please. So the World Health Organization, um, March 11th of this year, declared COVID-19, the disease, to be a pandemic 
And sometimes it's, a, it's helpful to understand what a pandemic is. Um, there are three elements that are required for a pandemic. The first element is probably the most important. It has to be a novel virus. And that word novel or new means a virus that had not previously circulated in the human population. And that means that no one in the population has built up any immunity to that virus because they haven't seen it before. The second element is what's called sustained community spread. And that means it's not associated with travelers entering uh, the United States from a source country like China that occurred in January. The virus has to be in the country spreading from person to person. That community spread is extremely important. And that's why the World Health Organization didn't declare uh, COVID-19 to be a pandemic in January or even February. They had to wait to see the community spread. And then the third element is COVID-19 has to be distributed worldwide. And now there are upwards of 160 countries in which you can see it, in which there are over a million cases. In the United States, we're approaching uh, 250,000 cases. In Canada, we're approaching 10,000 cases. Next slide, please. So what is COVID-19? Well, it's a respiratory disease. It's not a gastrointestinal disease. It's a respiratory disease. So that means that the virus has to get into the respiratory system. And that's why the nose and the mouth and even the eyes, although less frequently, but the nose and the mouth, that virus has to get down into the respiratory system. If it does, and its viral receptors attach to your receptors on your respiratory cells, then you come down with the viral disease called COVID-19. So what are the major symptoms? Well, about 90% of people that develop COVID-19 develop fever. About 70% develop a dry cough and about 30 to 40% develop trouble breathing, shortness of breath, chest tightness. Those are the major symptoms. There are other symptoms, but they are uh, smaller. Uh, diarrhea, headache, those types of symptoms. The average time from when you're exposed to the virus to when you come down with those symptoms is about 5.2 days. And 99% of individuals who are exposed exhibit those symptoms within 12 to 14 days. And that's, uh, as you recall, that 14 days is what we hear as self-isolation period or quarantine period. So that's the source of that 14-day uh, period is looking at 99% of individuals coming down with symptoms by the 14th day from exposure. Now, there are people who get COVID-19. Not everybody requires hospitalization for severe respiratory distress. Uh, people can have uh, what's called milder disease. Although if you talk to any of those people, they will not tell you that the disease is, is mild. They will tell you that it's been rough on them uh, and that takes them a while to recover. Even hospitalized individuals who recover sometimes spend upwards of three weeks in the hospital. And then as you're hearing more and more, and we have more evidence, uh, that people may become infected with SARS coronavirus 2 and yet not feel sick at all. Now they may be pre-symptomatic, meaning they haven't as yet gotten the symptoms, or they may be totally asymptomatic and may remain asymptomatic for quite a while. And that's something that's worrying us. And some of you may have uh, heard on the television from the White House 
daily briefings that CDC is thinking of recommending that everyone wear facial coverings, uh, assuming uh, for uh, the moment that we all may be infected but asymptomatic and we want to protect others uh, that uh, are not infected. So you'll hear more about that, I think, in the coming days. Uh, next slide, please. So people ask, well, you know, isn't there a medication for this? Well, there's no proven medications to treat COVID-19. There are several medications that are undergoing clinical trials uh, in uh, individuals who have COVID-19 to see if they're safe, first of all, to use, and then if they're efficacious. Do they actually work in killing SARS coronavirus 2? So there's two things you have to find out with any medication, a new medication or a new use for an old medication. Are they, is it safe to use in that particular set of patients? And does it actually kill the virus? Is it efficacious? So for example, there are, are some trials going on with remdesivir, which is a antiviral. Um, there are existing medications like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. This is a malarial drug uh, and an arthritis drug called Plaquenil. Um, uh, as yet, we don't have hard evidence that the drug works to treat COVID-19. Although we've seen uh, from China a uh, initial tantalizing report uh, about its efficacy in patients in China. Uh, we do have a number of uh, studies going on here in the United States using that drug. Also, uh, a number of what are called monoclonal antibodies uh, are being tried against uh, one of the uh, agents that your body uh, manufactures to fight off uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 called interleukin-6. Uh, and there are antibodies against that to tampen down what it's called the, 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 the severe response that the body makes to the virus, which sometimes can actually end up harming the body. So there's a lot of work going on in the medication area. Uh, stay tuned uh, for that. Next slide, please. So people ask about vaccines. Um, uh, the uh, Chinese and CDC uh, determine the entire genetic code for the virus very, very quickly in January. And that allowed vaccine candidates to be developed very, very fast. And that then allowed individuals to be enrolled in candidate vaccine trials to determine, first of all, is it safe? There is a vaccine trial going on uh, in Seattle, Washington now. 45 people are enrolled in a safety trial. Uh, that data will be looked at, and then uh, others will be enrolled in an efficacy trial. Again, that balance between safety and efficacy. If that works and that vaccine uh, is uh, both safe and effective, then a large population trial will probably be conducted. People say, well, how long is that going to take? The timeline that we hear from experts like Dr. Fauci at NIH is somewhere between 12 and 18 months. I think we all hope that that is shortened, uh, but that is the average time that it takes a vaccine to come uh, for population use. And that's an important issue because we have to concentrate on what we can do now while we're waiting for medications and vaccines. So as we'll talk about the mitigation measures here in a minute, that means that that's all we got until we come up with a medication and or a vaccine. That makes the mitigation such as physical distancing that we're going to talk about, extremely important and our only defense at the present time. Next slide, please. So let's talk about how this virus is transmitted. And it's not unlike the way other viruses are transmitted, chiefly 
uh, influenza, which is, uh, as we all know, uh, seasonal, uh, usually in January and February. It starts dropping out in March in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we're all familiar with how influenza is transmitted. Well, similarly, this virus is transmitted from person to person through what are called droplets, respiratory droplets. These are fairly large uh, particles. Um, the droplets uh, carry the virus, and sometimes this is saliva, mucus, uh, sputum, uh, carries the virus, transmitting the infection when these droplets travel directly from the respiratory tract the nose or the mouth, of the infected individual to the mucosal surfaces of the uninfected individual, uh, nose and mouth primarily, and also eyes. The droplets are produced primarily when you cough, when you sneeze, uh, or as we're finding out, if you speak forcibly, uh, a lot of times uh, that can happen also. Now, the second way that the virus is transmitted is through what's called direct contact. And that's contact, physical contact, between an uninfected person and an intermediary surface or object, like a doorknob or a desktop, which has then been recently contaminated. Usually we're talking about hours, maybe a day or two. We're not talking about weeks or months contaminated with SARS coronavirus 2. That can occur. So what happens then, as we all know, when a person touches that contaminated surface or object with their hands, and our, our hands and our fingers are our worst weapons here, and the best weapons for the virus, because the virus doesn't have wings and it doesn't have legs. So it needs us to transfer itself to new people. So if we touch this contaminated object or surface with our hands, and then we touch our hands to our mouth, our nose, or our eyes, voila, contact transmission has occurred. Okay, next slide, please. So let's take a little break here and talk about contact transmission. Uh, here we're talking about the environmental persistence of SARS coronavirus 2 on surfaces and objects. Now we don't have um, uh, a lot of studies, but there have been a few published uh, that have looked at the persistence of the virus on various uh, environmental surfaces. And here the, the, the authors are wiping uh, surfaces uh, and finding viral RNA. Now that's the type of genetic uh, material that the virus has. As you know, we have DNA, but this is an animal virus and they use RNA. So they wipe these surfaces and then they see how much of that virus is in that surface over a number of hours after they've contaminated that surface. So in the case of aerosols, which we're talking about, which are small particles that float a little further than a respiratory droplet does, um, they can find viral RNA up to three hours. On copper, up to four hours. On cardboard, up to 24 hours. Plastic, two to three days. Two to three days for stainless steel. Uh, the mean uh, amount of time for plastic and stainless steel is around two uh, to three days, but sometimes uh, a little less. Uh, if, uh, if, if we could go back one slide, uh, Pete, that would, uh, that would be great. Just uh, one slide. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I have a caution here because, you know, these studies are the only ones we have, but they're based on the detection of the RNA. Uh, which is the genetic material. And that, that certainly may indicate that viral shedding has occurred at some point in the past, but we can't say that that means that there's actual viable virus there on that surface. And what I mean by viable means that it's virus that can actually cause infection. So we can't necessarily equate those two. And that's one of our concerns at NIOSH to do the studies that would 
have us look at viable virus as the outcome or endpoint. Thank you, Pete. Next slide. Now, we don't have to worry about all that science because the good news is that exposures can be minimized without the use of any of that fancy environmental sampling. Environmental contamination, wherever you may think it exists, on surfaces, on groceries that you bring home from the grocery store, et cetera, can be minimized with routine cleaning and infection practices with readily available and affordable products. That's the good news. And if you go on an EPA website for disinfectants, you'll see there are currently 280 seven available products registered with the EPA that can be used for COVID-19. And I give you some examples here that you can use, 60 to 70% ethanol containing products, 50% isopropanol containing products, or 0.5% sodium hypochlorite containing products. Buy your a bottle of bleach. Uh, there are instructions on the bottle of bleach. Uh, for dilution in terms of how uh, many teaspoons or cups you need per gallon. Uh, the thing I would stress is don't just uh, put the, these, these uh, disinfectants on as they are. Clean the surfaces, get the dirt away first because the dirt will interfere with the action. And then if you get the dirt out of the way, then leave these compounds on at least for a minute. Don't just wipe them and then think you've done a great job because you want to kill the virus, that takes a few uh, seconds. Don't just uh, do this rapidly. Thank you, Pete. Next slide. So one of the things that we're doing in healthcare, uh, we've published uh, guidance on how to decontaminate uh, uh, an N95. Now, we've done this primarily for healthcare institutions that are running quite low on N95s. But if you use N95s in your workplace, then I encourage you to look at this guidance, which we just published earlier this week. Uh, we look at three methods that can be used, uh, a vaporous hydrogen peroxide method, an ultraviolet germicidal radiation uh, process, and a heat and humidity process. Uh, also recently, the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine uh, produced some uh, guidance on, on this uh, issue. So if you're interested in decontaminating N N95s and reusing them, you might look at the, our guidance on the CDC website. Thank you, Pete. Next slide. So let's talk about aerosol transmission. This is the third way you can get transmission. So we, we talked about large respiratory droplets. We talked about contact in great detail. Now we're going to talk about aerosols. And you can see from the picture here, there are quite a few droplets that are falling very close to this individual that is sneezed. But there are droplets towards the top of the picture that seem to be uh, going a little further off. Now, they're not going to go uh, very, very far. They're not going to get in. We have no evidence that they're going to get into the HVAC systems and all of that. And certainly if you're in a ventilated workplace or you're working outdoors on a construction site, we don't expect this to be an issue. But aerosols could be an issue if you're in a relatively closed environment involving a high concentration of aerosols over a prolonged period of time where an uninfected person is close to the source. We call this close contact aerosols. And we're certainly worried about this in healthcare settings, as you can imagine. So those are the three transmission methods, respiratory droplets, contact, and aerosols. Next slide, Pete. So let's talk about mitigation. Now, we're gonna talk about a lot of things in mitigation, but it all boils, it all arises actually, and boils down to a simple principle. And, and this is what I alluded to before with the medications and the vaccine. Until we have a vaccine, or until we have medications to treat people who get this disease, we have to keep infected individuals separated from uninfected individuals. Now, this is very hard to do if you don't know who's infected and who's not infected. And that's why some presumptions are important here. 
everything we're doing now in terms of protecting ourselves is based on this simple principle. And it's the only thing that we have going forward to slow the spread. Next slide. So what's the core principle we're talking about here of separating the infected from the uninfected when we don't know whether we are infected or whether we are uninfected? And that's physical distancing based on these transmission methods. Uh, it used to be called social distancing and you'll still, still hear that, but we wanna take the word social out of it because we're trying to de-emphasize sociability here. Doing physical distancing is the opposite of socializing with someone. So that's why we're using physical distancing these days. Uh, as you know, we, uh, in, in most states and provinces of Canada, uh, we've uh, finished our first U.S. national 15-day uh, stay-at-home period of physical distancing. Um, and now we're in our additional 30-day period of physical distancing. Uh, Canadian provinces and municipalities are gradually implementing stricter stay-at-home measures also to, implement, uh, to limit the spread of the virus. Um, the basic principle here in physical distancing requires us to maintain a minimum of six foot separation between people while conducting our daily lives, including working, food shopping when we have to do it, and other essential activities. Now, a lot of people ask, well, gee, where did this six foot thing come from? Well, it comes from over 100 years ago. Uh, in the uh, pandemic of influenza, which is the last pandemic that we uh, went through uh, in 1918 through 1920, where if the beds uh, the, of individuals who were infected were separated at least by six feet, uh, the individual in the next bed did not acquire the influenza. So it's based on essentially the respiratory droplet and the close contact uh, aerosol transmission. We think six feet uh, would do it. Now, I say minimum here because if you can do 12, <laughs> it's even better. People that I see jogging in the park here in Washington are maintaining certainly more than six feet between them. Um, I, I point out that in the United States, I think uh, I may be wrong here because this is yesterday's slide set, but I think there are now about 10 states in the U.S. that, have stay at, that do not have stay-at-home orders in, uh, in effect. Um, and what's interesting here, I think, for our audience today is that um, there's not a lot of uniformity uh, uh, in terms of what, uh, what jobs and tasks are considered essential services. And in many of these states that have a stay-at-home order in effect, construction is exempt from the stay-at-home orders. Uh, they are called an essential service. Uh, and that raises a lot of issues for us that we're gonna discuss in a few minutes is how do you keep yourself safe and on a construction site when you are uh, been labeled by that state, categorized by that state or province as an essential service? Uh, next slide, Pete, thank you. All right, so let's talk about testing for a minute here. Now, I don't want to make your brain explode, but uh, diagnostic testing uh, is, is getting more complicated, and we need to know it uh, because as testing becomes more broader in the U.S. and Canada, you may find yourself uh, having to take a test, not because you have symptoms, but because you're part of a surveillance project where we're trying to figure out what is the prevalence, the amount of people in the population that have uh, the virus. So there are now two types of tests. The first one and the more common one that you hear about is essentially a test for the virus itself, the viral antigen, the viral genetic material, Fancy name is nucleic acid amplification because that's the method they use to amplify the small amount of viral RNA that they find in a person's nose or mouth. And this measures 
current infection with SARS coronavirus 2. Okay, that's the test that we hear about. That's the uh, test that the President of the United States talked about in his news conference where he took this very fast five minute test. Uh, this is the uh, viral test. Now, the other test that you're going to hear more about is an antibody test. Uh, it detects antibodies. Now, antibodies, you know, are good things. After you get the flu, for instance, your body recovers and develops antibodies to that flu. So if you're exposed to that strain again, your body will be able to nip it in the bud, attack it before it grows in your body. So antibodies are good. Next slide, please. So this is a chart, you know, contrasting these two tests. And I draw your attention uh, to the column that says value. Um, clearly, as we know, the viral RNA test helps us know whether somebody is infected. It also helps the doctor figure out what's going on with that patient. Um, and it also can inform us about whether uh, we need to really uh, isolate ourselves uh, for 14 days, for instance. The antibody test uh, detects individuals uh, who may be antibody negative, okay, and they're obviously susceptible to being infected, but they also detects individuals who may have the antibodies. In other words, they had uh, coronavirus uh, COVID-19 disease and they recovered from it, or maybe they didn't even know they had it and they have positive antibodies. So we will hear more about the use of this antibody test as we go through time. Uh, we may see it more uh, and more as we try to figure out who can return to economic work activity without worrying about getting the virus. Uh, we can use it in healthcare settings where nurses and doctors who may have antibodies in their particular uh, uh, bodies may then be assigned to the more risky tasks in a hospital. Next slide, uh, please, Pete, thank you. So here we have hygiene, and you hear this over and over again. There are signs everywhere. Um, the personal hygiene task of staying home when you're sick, covering your sneezes and coughs, washing your hands frequently, these are all the hygiene things that we emphasize, and they are extremely important, and, and do not uh, dismiss them as something that, that is not important. Um, and I'll give you some hand washing advice. You know, use soap. Soap actually breaks up the very delicate envelope of the virus. Um, keep that soap on your hands, not just on your fingers, but on the front of your hands, the back of your hands, for at least 20 seconds. Use a lot of soap, uh, because uh, that will uh, really kill the uh, break the envelope of the virus if it happens to be on your, your hands. Um, and wash your hands frequently. You cannot wash frequently enough. We're touching things all the time. And then if you've ever tried to keep your fingers away from your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, it is a challenge. Next slide, please. Here's a little slide, which again, draws your attention to the ways to defeat the virus. And like your mom told you, soap and water really works. Um, ultraviolet light does, and as you know, that's one of the methods that we're using to decontaminate uh, N95s that we recommend. Heat and humidity also breaks up the structure of the viral protein, but nothing uh, you don't have ultraviolet light uh, in your workplace, and you really don't have a controlled environment where heat and humidity, you got soap, and if you use soap, that will do it. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Pete. So let's talk about construction workplaces pre-shift and during shift. Now, there's a couple disclaimers here that I have to put out. One, I drew these kinds of recommendations from uh, the literature that many uh, unions have put out, uh, many employers and uh, contractors have put out. 
uh, uh, drawn from CDC recommendations, World Health Organization recommendations. But I don't want you to say, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Because applying them to a construction workplace is a big challenge. And I'm not an expert in that area. So I want you guys to uh, pay attention to these, figure out uh, how you could use some of these in your workplace. And lastly, how uh, employers and employees can work together uh, in a labor management uh, cooperative manner to figure out, can we use some of these ideas, okay? So I don't want you to be laughing at the speaker here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the thing that we say all the time is, if you're sick, don't come to work. Stay at home. We don't know what you have. You know, these viral uh, upper and lower respiratory conditions all are associated with fever, cough, and shortness of breath. So you can't tell yourself, even myself as a physician, are not going to be able to figure out if the illness that I have with fever, cough, and shortness of breath is just some stray viral bronchitis or whether it's COVID-19. Now, the, the couple items here that, that I was putting down for the folks who are in charge of a work crew, um, asking workers to self-identify, do you have fever? Have you been coughing? Do you have any shortness of breath? before they come to the work site. Um, uh, and then those people that say yes to anything, and of course this is the honor system, okay, I have to realize that, you know, that that's true. We'll assume that everybody's on the honor system. They should be sent home. Clearly asking someone if they have a known close contact with COVID-19 positive case uh, or a, a family member that they are maybe taking care of or somebody who's self-isolating in their own home or apartment. Uh, that would be uh, good information to have. Or if they've been uh, asked by their doctor to self-isolate, uh, for instance. Um, clearly, the last point I think is extremely important. Uh, all visitors uh, to the job site have to be screened. Uh, and that, at a job site, uh, involves anybody who's bringing materials uh, and tools, et cetera, to the site. Um, doing temperature checks, as, as happens in a lot of work sites that are not construction. For instance, I went to my uh, own physician recently. Her building was locked. They let me in after I called upstairs. I sat in the lobby. They came down. They took my temperature before they even allowed me into the doctor's office. So this idea of temperature checking, and obviously they should be no touch contact thermometers, um, you know, that may be something that you could do when physical distancing on the site is just not possible. Um, the next point about crew uh, meeting toolbox talks, again, if they could be done with some physical separation, that would be great. Um, having somebody at a, a site, especially a, a large construction site, uh, that's doing site-specific uh, COVID-19 mitigation, and, and only that, um, I think is extremely important because that person not only can keep track of all the things that are, that are happening and, and the procedures that are going on, but they can also go around as a monitor and be able to check how well people are conforming to the rules of the work site. Next slide, uh, Pete, thank you. Okay, so here's some during shift kind of things. And again, nobody, ha nobody can laugh. Um, so clearly, you know, maintaining a six foot separation while working is what we I, I do. Now, now, in my office here in Washington, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, but again, at a work site where a crew needs to work close together, uh, and I have, I, have, I have a building that's being uh, constructed down the street here and here in Washington, D.C., uh, workers are, are essential. Uh, and I see it with my own eyes that it's very hard to separate out when you're carrying a, a large piece of metal and putting something in place, et cetera. You might look at choke points within the site that narrow down uh, and, and certainly break areas. Uh, and any kind of transportation buses that you're using and control them 
So you could uh, use physical distancing, distancing when, when you can, can do it. Uh, clearly minimizing interactions when picking up or delivering equipment. You don't have to have everybody down there meeting the truck. Uh, maybe you could try that. Um, modifying work schedules so you don't have, let's say, all trades on the work site at one time. Uh, providing alternating work days, et cetera. Uh, reducing the number of folks per shift. Uh, those are all possibilities. Restricting access to uh, enclosed and confined spaces uh, like a construction trailer, you know, that, that's relatively unventilated, um, you know, might be something that, that you can do. And certainly uh, in any enclosed space, uh, especially a break area, uh, these are uh, areas that you might look at uh, and the time in those areas might be minimized. Uh, next slide, uh, Pete, thank you. So PPE is an interesting thing in, in construction because unlike the normal grocery store where I've talked to employees and employees, uh, employers and employees of grocery store, you know, the idea of wearing PPE is very foreign to them. But on construction, it's not foreign at all. We have hard hats, we have safety glasses, many construction sites utilize uh, N95s for various reasons or even other types of, uh, of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, I say that gloves should always be worn on the, on, on the work site. Um, now, they have to be the right kind of glove because, you know, uh, iron workers pick up uh, uh, metal and having a cloth uh, glove is, is not going to work. Uh, but clearly, they help protect your hands, again, so that when you take the glove off and slide your, your finger uh, uh, through the glove, uh, the bottom, the inside of the glove, don't touch the outside of it. Um, pick up the edge of it and take it off. Uh, it keeps your fingers away from your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. So, uh, so that uh, I think is uh, important. Um, I think eye protection also, even if you don't need it to protect the eye, it protects you from sticking your finger in your eye again. I think that's an important thing. Um, and clearly, you know, uh, the work site, each work site is different in terms of respiratory protection, PPE, uh, if you can't augment ventilation, if you have to work very close together, uh, wearing an N95 or other mask, as, as I mentioned to you at CDC, we're now uh, going to be uh, 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 the Coronavirus Task Force and the White House is considering our recommendations with regard to everyone wearing some kind of facial covering. And at work sites, uh, I think that would be applying also. Next, next slide, Pete, thank you. Okay, so hygiene, we all know what to do. Don't touch your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Cover your coughs and your sneezes with your arm or some tissue and then get rid of the tissue and wash your hands if you don't have gloves on. Do not share your water bottles. And if you're entering a machine that somebody else has been in, wipe it down with disinfectant. Keep the disinfectant in the machine. Next slide, Pete. So, you know, decontamination, the same thing, you know, on work sites, hopefully, uh, there are porta potties and wash stations. Uh, again, uh, wash your hands with soap, at least for 20 seconds, periodically during the day, especially if, you, if your gloves have been off. Um, if you don't have one at running water at the site, then make sure your hand sanitizers are around and liberally use your hand sanitizer all over your hand, your, your, uh, both sides of your hand. Um, and then I think each site needs to have, uh, again, that on-site COVID-19 officer that would make sure that there's cleaning and decontamination procedures for all the tools, all the, 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 the gates, the equipment, the vehicles, the door handles, the handrails, the porta potties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, next slide, Pete. So I have some references if you really want to dig into this uh, and on the next slide. And otherwise, um, I'm done. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Yeah, with, so with okay, that. Okay, Pete. Gonna, yes, sir. I'm here. I, I just want to say, Dr. Howard, we have heard a lot of of information on this. We have seen a lot of uh, information on TV on every channel, but I don't think we've ever heard a better explanation of this 
on all the bullet points that you just expressed and that we have this morning. Okay. And Thank I you. truly mean that. And I wish that next Sunday morning you were the guest speaker on Face the Nation or Meet the Press because I tell you what, you, you would be better than anyone we've seen before. And we want to thank you on behalf of the thousand plus members that we have on here today. I know we can't give you a round of applause, but I certainly wish we could because you deserve it. And thank you for all you do. Uh, hang on the line here, uh, if you would, because we have Lynn Welsh up right now. And I think there could be some tag teaming, tam, tag teaming um, between you and Lynn on a couple of issues pertaining to job site issues and questions from the crowd. So hang in there if you can. We understand if you have to leave, if you're summoned to the White House or to the Hill, we understand that you may have to leave. So hang in there with us as long as you can. So thank you again. So uh, our next uh, guest speaker is, is Lynn Welsh. Uh, Hi, Lynn, folks. Lynn is the, uh, the former chief of California OSHA and has been a friend of the iron workers for many years. And uh, Lynn has fielded a lot of questions through the iron workers and other uh, contractors across the country regarding job site practices, safe practices, policies, and procedures. So Lynn, why don't you hit about the top 10 or 15 questions and issues that have been brought to your attention here in the last two or three weeks. Happy to do it, Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say real quickly about John Howard. You're never going to get better than him. Um, uh, he was chief of Cal OSHA before I was, and uh, I've never been as impressed with the leadership um, of a, a leader, the true leadership of a, an ostensible leader, uh, as John Howard is. Um, he's the best. And by the way, Steve, you forgot to say that he should run for office. Um, <laughs> that said, um, so we're, we need to bring this down to um, a practical gut level. And I have to say, um, I think everybody has gone through a, a, a pretty um, difficult learning curve on this issue. It, it's hard to develop, even now, a gut feel for how serious this hazard is and how to handle it in a common sense way that gives appropriate uh, deference to uh, how, how terrible uh, it can be to get this disease. And, you know, we've been hearing different statistics about the fatality rate. Um, I'm hearing a lot of in the 1% to 3% range. But it's not so much the fatality rate that, that's got the, the world really in a bind. It's the rate of cases that need hospitalization uh, and the cases that need ICU care, um, often with a ventilator. A big part of the strategy these countries are following is to keep the rate of advance of the disease low enough so that the hospitals can keep up with the patient load. Um, a lot of people uh, could die just from not getting the kind of care uh, they could be getting if the facilities were up to the task. So that's a big part of the strategy. We don't know ultimately what percentage of the population is going to get this disease, um, but we do know that slowing the spread is going to save an awful lot of lives just because it will keep the facilities able to handle the patient load. So. I'm asking everybody to keep that in mind, that there are real practical reasons why we should all be doing everything we can to, to stop the spread of this disease. And a big part of the gut feel of this is that you never really know, uh, in many cases, whether what you're doing is actually having an effect. We have to assume, because we don't have universal testing, uh, that you may have the disease, you, you may be symptom-free and spreading it without knowing it. And so we have to be assuming, uh, to err on the side of safety and health, that we could be transmitting the disease or we could be acquiring the disease from our contact and, and act accordingly. So, for example, um, we talk about respir respirators and masks. Um, people kind of use the, the words interchangeably, but generally speaking, a mask is something that protects someone else from what you breathe out or what you spit out or whatever. Um, you, surgeons use those when they're doing surgery because they want to protect the patient from whatever germs they might have. Uh, respirators generally are for protecting people from breathing in contaminated air. 
so uh, when when people say wear a respirator or wear a mask, uh, there are two things that can be happening. One is prevent, protecting people around you from what you breathe out, and the other is protecting yourself from what might be in the air. Um, generally speaking, whatever you can put around your mouth and nose uh, and whatever kind of eye protection you can wear is a good thing. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, you don't want to be touching your eyes and your mouth or your nose, so the more you sort of have them covered, the more you're going to be aware that you shouldn't be touching them. And again, it's all a matter of probabilities. Uh, you, you never, when, when you wear a respirator and it's properly fit tested, I know you all understand what respirators and fit testing are. You fit test to get the maximum utility out of the respirator. And with a good fit test, you get close to 100% protection, but not 100%. Usually it's in the 90 to 100% range, or not 90 to 98 or 9% range. Uh, you, you're never completely there, but you've got a high probability of protecting yourself. When you don't fit test a respirator, you're still getting protection. You just don't know how much. Even if you wear a rag around your nose and mouth, if that's all you have, that's going to give you some protection. It's nothing to rely on, but it's going to give you something. And you should always be thinking about the practices you engage in. Is it likely that I'm going to get something useful out of this so that I should be doing it? Uh, that really should guide every every decision you make in terms of protecting yourself. So how does this apply to construction? Well, the first thing to know is that um, requirements, you know, issued by OSHA or recommendations issued by NIOSH or any other agency only go so far. The real work has to be done as you apply these uh, messages to your own particular workplace. Um, you all are going to have to be looking at your own workplace and coming up with your own procedures to implement what you think uh, are the best procedures to protect yourselves yet allow the work to be done. And this really is a partnership. As John mentioned, this, if there ever was an issue that labor and management should march in lockstep on, it's this one. You all have exactly the same interests. Uh, you want to get paid, you want to stay in business, but most of all, you want to protect your health. That's good for all of you. Um, the, only, the only entity we, we've left out, really, I think, in our discussion, and we have to keep in mind, is the general contractors. A lot of um, all of these sites, really, are ultimately run by the general contractor and the, and the site owner uh, directing the general contractor. And historically... I know that steel erection sites and uh, reinforcing steel sites um, have issues with general contractors not necessarily cooperating with what both the employees and the subcontractors think is needed to be done. So we, we do have to work on bringing the general contractors into the fold on this. They, too, have an identical interest. They want to see the job go forward, but they don't want to see the job uh, activity turn into a disaster. So uh, we should be working on communicating with them and bringing them on board. And frankly, if they don't cooperate, they're looking at potential liability. Uh, that's one little footnote. Uh, there will be lawsuits over this at some point. Somebody will be claiming, particularly in California, which is overly litigious, that somebody didn't do something they should have, some, some entity didn't do something it should have to protect a worker uh, or, or a member of the general public from contracting this disease, but that's kind of a footnote. Um, so basically, as we think about how to practically implement these, these messages, I can, I can give you a couple examples. Uh, construction personnel hoists are prevalent on many job sites throughout the country. Uh, they're a requirement in some states. Uh, that's a classic way for people to get too close together. And so um, you're going to have to develop procedures to make sure that the use of CPHs uh, is done in a way that, that um, prevents people from getting too close together. I know many of you have had an experience now of just waiting in line to get into a grocery store. And you see people sort of naturally standing, hopefully you see people naturally standing six feet apart. Uh, hopefully you see some employee of the grocery store managing entry and exit from the store, uh, deciding at some point if three people exit, three more people can enter, so that the um, some uh, developed concept of what the maximum building occupancy should be during the pandemic 
is complied with. Uh, it's same thing for a CPH, uh, same thing even for moving from one part of the job site to the other if, for example, you're going up or down a staircase. Um, and particularly when you're in an enclosed space. The fortunate thing about, um, about steel erection and reinforcing steel work is most of that work is done outdoors. And working outdoors is much easier to uh, bring into line with procedures that are going to mostly protect people. Again, I say mostly because you, you never get a 100% guarantee. It's all about probabilities. It's all about minimizing risk to the extent you reason, reasonably can. So uh, as John mentioned, entering a machine, a tractor or something like that, or any, any kind of machine, uh, a truck cab, whatever, once you're entering into an enclosed space, these issues become acute and they require competent, vigilant management so that people don't get too close together. Um, there is a lot of work, by the way. There's supporting work that's done in shops. And shops can, be, can have open doors or closed doors. They can have varying levels of ventilation. So shop work, again, is a kind of work in an enclosed space. Uh, it's a large enclosed space. And larger enclosed spaces like, uh, like um, steel manufacturing shops or warehouses are easier to manage because there happens to be a lot of room to move around. But again, two issues. Uh, people have to come together to get some job done. Uh, if you have to come together, you have to come together, but you don't do it unless you have to. Uh, and normally speaking, when people don't have to come together, then the distancing concept stands out uh, as something to, to be observed. Um, I mentioned before that it, this really, a lot of this is developing a gut feel for the hazard, and many of us are still struggling with that. I am myself. I, a lot of time, my gut reaction when I see people standing in a, in a line in a grocery store is, oh, geez, here we go again. Why do I have to do this? That's the gut reaction because we're not used to this. But, you know, that's when you sort of, you know, your higher self, your reasoning self has to take over and say, this is new. This is not something we're all used to, and we're trying to feel our way now to a different way to act temporarily, although, you know, it's not going to be that temporary. We're looking at uh, a long time before we have to, or before we can stand down on our vigilance with this. <clears throat> um, so, um, I guess what I'm saying is there's kind of a culture change involved here, and people have heard the phrase uh, work safety culture, and this is a great example of how you have to develop a culture around a hazard. Um, and uh, compliance is an issue, too. It's one thing to have rules. Uh, it's one thing to have requirements. It's yet another altogether to have compliance, and I don't mean enforcement. People tend to confuse those concepts all the time. I mean compliance. Compliance is when you actually do it. And in order to get compliance, people have to embrace the value uh, of what, uh, what is being complied with. And iron workers actually, I think, are among the most disciplined of workers you can find anywhere. They have the kind of discipline that soldiers often have. Uh, they know that the safety of the people around them depends on their own individual safety and their own individual actions. So no iron worker would ever dream 60 feet above the ground of throwing a wrench down to the ground. They just wouldn't do it because you don't do that. Everybody knows it. It's in your gut. And we have to be developing now that same kind of gut feel for social distancing on the job. There just has to be a gut feel for when you're getting too close, how you can manage to get something done by maintaining distance. And enforcement of that um, actually, enforcement, like I said, is a different issue, but enforcement does, in some cases, help with uh, compliance. And the most effective enforcement you all are going to have is yourselves. Um, you know, when I've gone to grocery lines around here, if I get too close to people, <laughs> they let me know it. And uh, I think y you individual workers are going to be the best enforcers out there. You're going to develop, uh, you know, a custom and practice rapidly about how to deal with this. And everybody is going to expect everybody else to be doing that, just like everybody expects you not to throw a wrench uh, down to the ground when you're, when you're up off the ground. So developing the culture, developing the gut feel is what you have to focus on. Um, there are some individual habits to be thinking about. There I went rubbing my nose, shame on me. Um, uh, I understand a lot of folks chew tobacco, uh, and when you chew tobacco, you tend to spit it. Uh, 
you can't do that. You can't. I mean, ideally, you don't chew tobacco. If you have to have nicotine, you chew gum or something. But if you're going to be chewing tobacco, there has to be a place to spit it. There has to be um, proper disposal. And tissues, anything like that, has to go somewhere where there's proper, vigilantly managed disposal. Uh, that's just critical. Um, cigarette smoking, you don't toss your cigarette butts around because, as John mentioned, uh, virus hangs around, at least the virus RNA hangs around for quite some time on various surfaces. We don't know how long the virus is, vi is viable and transmissible, but we do know that it hangs around, and there's a good chance it hangs around for a long time in a state where somebody could pick it up. So people should be mindful of stuff that they that has contacted their skin and they toss on the ground or toss somewhere else, all that stuff has to go into a special container to be disposed of. Uh, toilets and hand-washing facilities uh, need to be uh, in abundance on, in all work sites. Um, they have to be, you know, uh, kept clean, disinfected routinely, uh, and especially uh, one thing that suffers often is hand-washing uh, at the toilet facilities, and that has to be vigilantly uh, maintained that you know the resources to make sure that happens uh, has to be uh, vigilantly have to be vigilantly maintained. So I think um, I think I'm going to stop with it there. You all may have some questions about practicality. Um, that's really where the rubber hits the road. That's that's where you uh, start developing practices that make sense and that are, are effective. So I'm going to leave it at there, and I think it's time to open man. things up for question and answer. Thanks, Len. Thanks. Thank uh, you, Len. We've got uh, a bunch of questions here in the docket, so I'll go ahead and read them. And I think between uh, the two experts and, and Mr. Rank from the Iron Workers, we should be able to get them answered. First one is, the question is, is low grade or high fever a common symptom of COVID-19? They're asking because some uh, employers have begun implementing temperature checks to enter the construction site. Um, Dr. Howard, I think John, that's for you. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, uh, usually the separation between low and high is a, um, a little controversial, um, but clearly above 100 is probably outside the range of low grade. Um, now, with COVID-19, if you have it, you're not going to have any problem in telling because your temperature is going to be above 100, 101, sometimes 102. So there won't be any doubt of that. Uh, but the dividing line uh, that we use often is 100. All right. Um, what percentage who become infected are typical, typically asymptomatic? Do we have that information yet, Dr. Howard? No, we don't. And that's what everyone wants to know. If you listen to Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks on the White House briefings that are done, that's the figure they're trying to figure out. Now, the CDC director has said uh, he estimates somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the population may be asymptomatic, but we don't know that answer. And again, it's the issue about the presumption of infectivity that we have now. Now, if we're suddenly wake up tomorrow and we have universal testing uh, and we know that figure, uh, I'm not sure it's going to help us because we still don't know which of us actually is the one that's infected or not. So that still goes to the issue of physical distancing. Okay. Um, if I could just add to that, um, even so, what we take from that is te checking somebody's temperature is not going to be a guarantee that they're not um, they're not infected and capable of transmitting the disease. But it's still something that's going to filter out a significant percentage of people who could transmit the disease. So it's a very important thing to do. It's all we have right now uh, as we wait for the, for the better test to become, uh, you know, well distributed. Yeah, I think that's a good point to make, Lynn, because if you flip around the 20 or 25 percent, you're talking about 75 or 85 percent of people are going to actually exhibit symptoms. They're going to have fever that you could be able to tell on a thermometer. And this is what the countries that have had success preventing the disease started doing right away. I mean, they, they worked with what they had. Uh, they, got, they jumped on it right away, then they moved on to better testing, but it all started out with temperature checks. All right. Uh, 
what about uh, the reuse of N95 masks by the same user? Is it plausible for them to, to use it several days in a row? Is it washable? Those kind of things as far as one user on an N95 mask. Well, there's a lot of questions there. You know, the first issue is, again, I would refer to the CDC guidance on the decontamination of filtering face piece respirators. And you can look that up on the website and that tells you uh, the various methods that are used. And there's a lot of other information that large medical centers like Duke uh, in North Carolina have in terms of how they're decontaminating their respirators. One of the things that I would mention on a construction site, because it is being used in healthcare, is the idea of having a week's worth, well, let's say a construction site, you're there every day for five days, having five N95s. And you take the first one out and you use it that day, and then you put it in this brown bag and you leave it in there okay, for the whole week until the next Monday. And then the second day you take from the clean bag, the second N95, you use that on the second day and then you put that in the dirty bag and you're essentially creating a sort of environment in which the virus is, if, if it is contaminated on the N95, is dying off over those five to seven day period of time because it's not gonna survive. So you're essentially uh, looking at sort of a poor man's decontamination type uh, 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 type uh, process. All right. um, I would add. I would add one thing. Um, you know, you work with what you have. <laughs> you only have one respirator. You want to use it for as long as you can. Um, there's nothing to stop you from dampening a cloth uh, and wiping it down with an alcohol solution. Um, it's not going to not going to be perfect, but it's going to get you something. You want to be able to use it. If, if there is a shortage of respirators, you want to be able to use it as long as you can get use out of it. Uh, so again, be creative. Um, be mindful of doing anything that would spread the virus around. Don't blow air on it, compressed air on it, or something like that. Um, but, but work with what you have. All right. Uh, another question, actually several in this uh, vein. Person has the virus, has recovered, what do we know? Are they susceptible to getting it again? Well, that's a very good question. Um, right now, we don't have studies in human beings to answer that. But there are some studies in monkeys, uh, which have been dosed with coronavirus uh, 2, have come down with COVID-19, have recovered, and then been re-challenged with the virus, and they do not develop the disease again. So we think that if you can develop antibodies to SARS coronavirus 2, that it is similar to what happens with influenza and other viruses, that you then are immune to reinfection. Okay, um, and that goes along. I see another one that, that talks about if you're tested for these antibodies, are you safe to return to work? And, and based on what you said, I believe the answer is yes, but if you have anything to add as far as antibody testing. No, you're right, Pete. Uh, the answer is yes. Now, uh, at NIOSH, we're trying to develop return to work policy uh, that, that will contain return to work recommendations. Um, and one of the things I, that I emphasize right now, if, if you look on the television uh, stations, whether it's CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whatever, they'll have the number of people of cases. And right now in the United States, it's north of, of a quarter of a million. And then next to it, they'll have the, the deaths. Um, and if you look at the difference between the two, there are a lot of people and more and more each day that have been cases and over a certain period of time they have recovered and they have not died. So we're increasing the number of people who have recovered from the virus who can be tested for antibodies. Hopefully they are, they are positive and the most likely scenario is that they will be positive. And then those people 
uh, employers can uh, can bring, if, especially in the healthcare setting and in other economic activity. So that's the germ, if you will, of bringing the country back, whether it's the United States or Canada, into economic activity. So as we go through the next few months into the summer, we're going to see how do we do return to work uh, and what kind of changes that will make. Uh, and again, I emphasize uh, this situation is rapidly evolving. We are learning new things every day. What I said today is not going to be necessarily applicable next week. And one of the big things will be the increasing part of the population that will be antibody positive for SARS coronavirus 2 and can rejoin the workplace. All right. Um... Here's one on pre-shift questions, or, or I would pose it as uh, someone, say, takes that trip to Florida or has been in a state that hasn't been closed. They return back to their home or to that area that is closed and want to come back to work. Should they be forced to go through a self-quarantine period before coming back to work? Okay, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Was the place that they went to, uh, were they exposed to an individual with COVID-19? Uh, it doesn't say we that. We probably don't know. We, we don't know. We probably don't know. That would be a viable thing to ask too. What if you oh. are exposed? Okay, well, yeah, I think that, that would be a good question to ask. But that goes to the issue of what we're, what we're in the Coronavirus Task Force at the White House are considering right now today is we're trying to figure out would that person be a person that should have a should have a facial covering on um, in lieu of the 14 days because because we don't know for sure and we don't want to put somebody in a 14 day period of time uh, time out they have we don't know they've been exposed uh, because we don't have that information uh, so that idea of facial coverings uh, for the population at large. Uh, is is a is a factor in that type of scenario. I don't know, Len, if you have anything to add to that uh, that answer. Well, um, again, we're talking about presumptive, presumptive issues, right? Somebody comes from a state that's not regulating much. Um, uh, is there a presumption that that person is going to be riskier than a state that is regulating? And that's a huge presumption to have. Um, Certainly a facial covering would be a great idea, a uh, short wait period. You know, any, anything you can do to minimize, have them wait three days, have them wait two days, but sometimes you can't do that. It depends on how urgently that person needs to go back to work or how urgently that person's services are needed and the work they do. Uh, so again, I, that's an individual determination I think people need to make, but I, I don't think we, I think as John said, we're still trying to struggle with issues like that in terms of general guidance. All right. Um, next one, and this is one I think a lot of people might be wondering, if, if you share a home with someone who, who's tested positive, they go into quarantine in the home, are there any uh, guidances out there to explain how does that quarantine work? Do you put them in the basement? How do you get them meals? Any, anything of that nature? What's the protocol there? Well, Pete, you know, this is the question that I wait for every time I do. <laughs> um, and I would rank questions in terms of, of their difficulty in answering uh, based on the top 10. And this is number one. Uh, so uh, I congratulate the questioner. Uh, I hope that they're not actually dealing with this situation. But if they are, here's my take on that. If you have a lot of real estate and you're fortunate enough to have that real estate, then put that person in a room, give them the room, uh, let them use the bathroom. If they have their own bathroom, fine. They can use the bathroom wherever they want. If you have to share a bathroom, make sure that they're going into it and it's wiped down after they leave. If you have less real estate, then you know it's sort of like what you do with a new puppy. You may put a little fencing around part of the living room so the little puppies in the living room. If you have to do that and say, maintain this six foot distancing within a one bedroom apartment, okay? Again, I think it's gonna be the creativity of the people that are involved. 
but you want to do the same thing. It's the same principle as I, as I suggested in my presentation. It's the same principle, physical distancing. And you can, if you can do that with a lot of real estate, no problem. If you can do that within a one bedroom apartment, uh, then you're really uh, a very advanced home isolation unit. And please do a YouTube video and tell us all how you did it. <laughs> if I could just add, if I could just add, um, you know, you're going to have to assume, by the way, if a house member uh, has the disease or has been exposed to it, then you've been exposed also, no matter how good you are at social distancing within your, your living space. You're going to have to assume that you've been exposed and you could be transmitting it. All right. I guess uh, exercise extreme caution. Um, speaking of YouTube and Facebook, uh, there's lots of information out there on how to beat this. Uh, one question here talks about, and I'm not going to read the whole question, it's quite lengthy, but basically it's going around that if you inhale steam through your nose daily, 80 to 90 degrees, it's going to kill the virus. And of course, we've heard several other of these things out there on the internet. What are your thoughts on that? And these home type remedies? Uh, well, there are a lot of them. Uh, I, I agree with the questioner. Um, and uh, none have been uh, tested and, and shown to be effective. Uh, I'll just comment on the STEAM business. Um, you know, one of the questions that people often ask is, uh, and Dr. Fauci has talked about this, uh, is the issue of the seasonality of this and what we can expect in the summer. Uh, versus the winter. You know, in general, uh, viruses like cold, dry, in, 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 uh, in, uh, they do not, excuse me, they do not like cold, dry environments. Uh, they, they sort of like the moist, uh, humid environment like the, that exists in, in the human. Uh, so, you know, one of the issues is we're not sure how this virus is going to behave. Uh, but using uh, steam, uh, I don't think is uh, particularly uh, helpful in terms of what we know about viruses and what they like and what they don't like. There, yeah, and there is some confusion because there seems to be this um, sense, and I guess it's in the case of most flus, that summertime warmer weather somehow uh, inhibits transmissibility from person to person. Yet what John said about the environment they like uh, to infect somebody is true. So it's, it's still confusing and it's hard to make sense out of that. And also, the home rem those home remedies are just, you know, they're not, you have to assume they don't work. Sorry, go ahead, John. No, I was just saying, going to add, you know, in terms of this moist heat and all that stuff, you know, uh, the United States, uh, if you're in Florida, uh, you know, you have a moist, uh, warm climate all year round. So the seasonality right. thing doesn't work so well there. Right. All right. Uh, Quick note, I've had a lot of questions and if this is going to be made available, the answer is yes, it will be up on the impact website for everyone to view by early next week, along with the PowerPoint presentation. So we will have it on the on the website by early next week. Uh, this next question is quite long, so I'm going to try and try and break it down a little bit. But this person claims that we're hearing of a one to 3% death rate. However, um, they're quoting numbers as high as 20% of the closed cases right now are resulting in death. What are your thoughts and concerns on, is this creating a false sense of security for everyone out there? Well, you know, this is a, a, an area that we don't really know for sure because we don't have a picture of the scope of the infected population. For instance, if we were able to do universal testing of, every, of 325 million Americans, uh, and we would have a percentage of people who are infected, then you could calculate a case fatality rate and be really sure of, of that rate. But, but we don't have that information, so uh, we're estimating uh, fatality rates. And right now, most estimates indicate that it may be a little higher than influenza, but we, we just do not know with absolute certainty the case fatality rate uh, uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, but hopefully uh, with more testing, we're able to ascertain that. All right. Uh, I think this next question is gonna be a good one for Mr. Welsh. Um, this question is, 
Does the respiratory protection standard and uh, quality fit test apply when using KN95 masks? Good question. Um, the answer is, uh, who knows what OSHA is going to conclude. Um, you all should keep in mind that half the states in the country have their own state OSHA, and if you're looking for um, compliance guidance or regulatory guidance, you have to go to the agency that has jurisdiction over you. Like I said, half the states go to the state agency. The other half are directly ruled by federal OSHA. Um, the, the, the common sense answer would be uh, you do whatever you can manage. If you can have a respiratory protection program, have one. If you can't do that because you're, you're trying to get respirators out there because people need them right away, then get them out there. Uh, comply as much as you can with the respiratory program elements that there are. I mean, basically what the respiratory program exists to do is make sure that the respirator doesn't become a hazard itself, number one and also make sure that people understand what value they're getting from a respirator and what value they're not getting. Um, you know, the, they require initially that you get an exam to make sure you can handle a respirator. Uh, well, that would be a nice thing to have, but um, if you can't do it, I would say wear the respirator anyway. Um, you know, what we're talking about is an N95 uh, or perhaps a P100, something that looks a lot like just a face mask. We're not talking about a scuba tank or something like that. Where, where physical stamina would be much more of an issue. So you do what you can do. California had an experience with this last year with wildfires. Uh, people needed respirators right away. The general public needed them. Uh, workers needed them. And basically, the answer was do what you can do with a respirator because, you know, with, with everything taken into account, you're better off with that respirator than without, even without a respiratory protection program. But you do want to keep it clean. You do understand that if you can't fit test it, you're not getting as much protection as you would if you did fit test it um, and, and that kind of thing. So you can look to your local agency to see what, what or, or to federal OSHA to see what they say. I think you're going to find that what they say is a moving target. Um, they, they're not used to this. Um, and uh, guidance has been all over the map, as I've seen over the last several years, when people are talking about emergency situations. So bottom line is do what you can do, but, but uh, yes, wear a respirator, uh, no matter what, if you can do it. Um, Pete, could I comment on that question also? Certainly. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure of the questioner's motivation, but uh, if they are interested in the K95 respirator, uh, this is a Chinese-made uh, N95 that, uh, that is being shipped from China to the United States, and a lot of uh, workplaces uh, are uh, using them. Um, first of all, I, I would encourage if you're, if you're interested in exploring the K95 respirator issue further, you have to go on to the NIOSH website uh, and the FDA website. Uh, FDA uh, uh, just today issued, uh, expanded their emergency use authorization for non-NIOSH approved N95 respirators made in China. Um, and they have stated in that guidance um, that for the duration of the pandemic, when FDA cleared or NIOSH approved N95 respirators, and here they're talking about the surgical N95 versus the NIOSH approved N95. When they're not available, the FDA said they would not generally object to the importation and the use of respirators that are not in their emergency use authorization. They're outside of it, including the K95 respirator because it's not included in their emergency use if that that K, KN95 was on our list of respirator alternatives, and it is. Uh, so the issue that is of concern to us is the authenticity of that K95 because there are bogus K95s that are out there. It's a very complex situation. Uh, we can't go into the details here on the, on the webinar. So I encourage people to check uh, with the FDA website about respirators. 
and especially their emergency use authorization, which they just published today. And also on the NIOSH CDC website uh, also. Uh, if all that fails, uh, you can always send a uh, uh, call uh, the CDC info line and we can help you out. Pete, I had a quick um, let, let, let me uh, Let me just add to that real quick, Steve. Um, Remember, the FDA um, and NIOSH are advisory organizations. They're not setting requirements. Uh, often OSHA taps into those and say, follow their recommendations. But what you get, the information you get from FDA or NIOSH or any other agency um, it, it, other than OSHA is going to be advisory only. And the only thing I want to say is if the only thing you can get is a Chinese K95 respirator and you don't know or you don't know whether it's uh, approved or you or it is not approved. If that's the only thing you can get, wear it. It's still going to help. You just don't know how much it's going to help. The approval these agencies give uh, is giving you a certain level of certainty that the the, the equipment you're using uh, is efficacious, is, is effective at least uh, to a certain degree. But anything that anything you can get your hands on, if you can't get the certified equipment, uh, is better than nothing. One of the things I wanted to say that ties into all this is a current situation where our iron workers are required. They are considered to be essential workers uh, for good reason. We have some buildings that are up 18, 30 floors and they're an unstable structure. Uh, in places where we work where it's considered to be a seismic earthquake zone, such as the West Coast, anywhere along the West Coast, we have to stabilize those structures. So our iron workers, both our structural steel iron workers, our reinforcing iron workers are demanded to be on those projects as a quote, essential workers for reasons more than just meeting the job schedule. It's to stabilize the structure, the building, the bridge, okay? In such cases as uh, Dr. Howard and Lynn just mentioned, the only alternative we may have is to give them the best that we do have and the best practices and maybe these um, K94 um, masks from China may be the only thing that we can get our hands on, okay? So if that's the best that we can do, we have to certainly follow the best practices that have been shared with us today uh, with everything else. But um, I wanted to interject that as far as current projects and a demand to stabilize a lot of projects going on across the United States. All right, uh, we do have a lot of questions here, so we're gonna try to move through them all. Um, I wanna just let everyone know, I see a lot of questions popping up in the chat box. I will try to get to those, but we've got a lot in the Q&A tab, so we need to keep it moving. So, uh, Dr. Howard, I have a question here from someone who lives in my home state of Wisconsin, where it's still cool weather. You mentioned heat and humidity kills a virus, uh, what kind of temperature and humidity levels are you are you talking about? And do you believe that that summer coming to the U.S. and Canada is going to alleviate this problem? Well, I would I would encourage uh, folks to go to our decontamination guidance on the CDC website for filtering face piece respirators. And there's a lot of detail about uh, moist heat, heat and humidity uh, being used as a decontamination method. So I would refer people to our website. All right. Um, question here, and this is a good one. Many times, uh, I'll interject this, an iron worker task you, you can't do alone. It takes two, sometimes more people working together to lift an angle in place and weld it or hoist a piece of rebar and get it tied off. Uh, what exact PPE would you recommend when we can't maintain that less than six foot distance and should, should just one or both wear it or everyone? I'm gonna let Len take that question. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, well, the answer is you. You know, you. You. There's no reason to change the personal protective equipment you're wearing um, if it doesn't interfere with doing the job. A lot of this, folks, is really just applied common sense. If you don't need, if you've got a respirator on, no need to take it off. Working closely together, um, if, and you should be wearing it anyway. Um, it would be my advice. Uh, there's less urgency to wear it when you're working outside, but um, basically you should, you should, uh, there shouldn't be a difference unless something is getting in the way of you doing the work safely. 
And I don't say that lightly because it's, sometimes things do get in the way and what you're doing in the name of safety can actually create more of a hazard just because it is physically getting in the way. Uh, you want, you know, if something requires optimum visibility, um, you might need to take goggles off if you're wearing them. Um, if, if, if something requires optimum dexterity and something on your face is getting in the way or your, you know, your gloves are getting in the way, whatever, uh, you deal with that. But in, in most cases, you should be able to maintain whatever you've got in place already as you do the work. The main thing is to find ways to do uh, work jointly together that um, is as short a period of time as possible and doesn't, you know, that you don't get closer together than you actually absolutely have to to get the work done. But again, do not confuse health issues with safety issues. The bottom line when you're working at these job sites honestly is safety. You know, you, you know people get crushed, people fall, uh, things fall on, you know, things fall on their, their feet, um, things can impale them. So you, you take care of the immediate safety hazards first then you think about the health stuff. It's very important to get, get the sequence and the priority straight. Lynn, on, on this point is, I do not want any of our contractors or members to separate themselves when they do need to work together. I don't want anyone to yes. a, a hurt back, a sprain, a strain, a crust, finger or a foot only because they were prohibited from working closer to someone that needed them to position a piece of iron. Maybe it's a piece of curb stock at the edge of the building. Maybe it's another piece of uh, detail work doing curtain wall work. So you're right. We have to use common sense approach and we don't want to incur other injuries because we're limited by the six foot distance when we have to work in close proximity with other members to prevent other types of injuries. So that's something we have to be mindful to as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I've got several questions here I'm going to combine, and, and I think they're coming from the standpoint of, of an iron worker in the field. Uh, isn't it reasonable to expect that these recommendations are implementable, let alone enforceable? And if they're not being enforced and I have concern, who do I go to? Uh, union steward, the superintendent, Department of Health, OSHA, What's the process there? So, Lynn, um, Steve, do you want to you want to address that first? Or do you want me to? Well, I, I will. From from an iron worker standpoint, our organization, uh, the first line of defense is go to your supervisor. Okay, the supervisor is something we've been concentrating on for a long time now, and the roles and responsibilities of the supervisor in the workplace. That is the first person that a worker, an iron worker should go to if he or she has a problem or a concern. That supervisor should be trained by their employer on how to respond to whatever the issues are, okay? Because you remember a supervisor is not considered to be a regular field iron worker. They're considered to be a company management representative, okay? That's acting on the interests of the employer, making decisions on behalf of that employer. So my answer to that question to the iron workers asking that is contact that supervisor, whether it's your foreman, general foreman, or superintendent, and that's your first step. And then they should be trained to contact the office to get the answers if they need be. Lynn, did you have anything to add to that? Well, uh, two things. At what point do they go to the union, Steve? Well, they would have to go to the union if an issue cannot be resolved within the, the uh, subcontractor and the general contractor. And if there continues to be a dispute, it may be a situation where they have to call a local union or district council president to say, we have a unique situation here. We cannot do this work and do it safely and protect our men in accordance with your policies or procedures, for example, okay? We need a little bit of flexibility okay. with safety. So. I would say that'd be the last resort is calling the local union. I think most of these things can be resolved between the subcontractor and the general contractor if the right people are discussing it. Uh, okay, so um, you, you know, you're always entitled to complain to an OSHA agency, whether it's a state OSHA agency or federal, depending on what state you're in. I'm gonna guess they're getting inundated uh, at this point with complaints like that. 
and um, they're having to um, sort out which ones they're going to respond to. So um, unless it's something egregious, uh, they probably are not going to be able to give much of a response. Um, and you should keep in mind, is something, is something really egregious? I mean, are, 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 is social distancing being completely ignored? Um, is anything interfering uh, on the part of the employer with the employee's use of personal protective equipment? Uh, a lot of times employers are going to leave it up to the employees, depending on what state you're in. Um, and so um, it's good to have an educated workforce. And employees, I mean, the employer should be, should be taking care of all safety issues, but the sad truth is a lot of the time they don't, and they leave stuff up to the employees. Uh, so uh, certainly they should not be interfering. If they've got a problem with an employee wearing goggles or a respirator or gloves or anything like that, uh, certainly that, that is egregious and that should be cl complained about. But I think Steve is absolutely right. Try to take care of it at the first level if you possibly can. In most situations, just bringing it to a supervisor's attention, you know, doing it in a, uh, you know, in a non-threatening way uh, and trying to reason with them most of the time is going to produce the result you need. They, they get it. They should be getting it too. They should all be understanding we are all at risk here, and we want to be doing what we reasonably can to mitigate that risk. All right. Um, as long as we're on that topic, there's a question here. It says, what is OSHA doing to make sure that all these rules and guidelines are being followed? Uh, well, that's going to vary. Um, so far, I'm not really seeing anything, uh, honestly, from any OSHA agency that is um, really, uh, really demonstrating that the agency has a handle on the issue and is prepared to enforce any set of protections. Um, they're, they're giving out a lot of guidance. Uh, the guidance itself varies, and you're going to probably, it's a moving target. You're going to probably see that change over time. Um, you know, you can certainly complain to an agency. You can certainly look on their website to see what they're recommending, but most of what you're going to see is recommendations. All right. Um, what do we know as far as handouts or anything people can get uh, maybe to hang in a job trailer, uh, this kind of information? Anybody have that? We see a couple questions like that. Well, OSHA actually has on their website a nice one pager that um, certainly could use. Um, and that there's a lot of uh, labor unions that I've seen have produced uh, information like that. Um, so I don't know, maybe. Uh, Maybe Steve knows uh, of Ironworkers uh, Union producing such things. Yeah, we're working on some additional flyers, posters that we send out via email, cheapest way possible, and then to try to trickle it down, trickle it down to those job site trailers and workplaces. So, the answer is yes. We are have some available and working on more. Okay. Um. Well, I'm trying to read through a lot of these. Again, we've got a lot of questions here. We want to try and get most of them answered. Uh, this comes from an iron worker perspective, and it's probably a good one that maybe should be answered. Uh, this person just brings up a situation where when summer does come, it's a hot, humid day. You're working with a partner. You're, you're required to wear this mask, and it's dirty. It's falling off. You're sweating. All these things going on. What are our thoughts there when, when, when out in the real world, when that mask just becomes almost unwearable? Well, uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, folks in uh, West Africa during the last Ebola uh, epidemic, we, we experienced that uh, by, by our NIOSH personnel. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, we had to come up with uh, uh, workarounds to that in terms of of moving out of the uh, the area in in, in uh, uh, the zone of danger and wiping down your face and reapplying the respirator, we also had to switch your higher level respirators, uh, like a elastomeric uh, 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 issue. So so you're going to have to probably um, think how you can can work around uh, these issues of humidity. And uh, Len may have some thoughts on that too. Um, sorry, I was off the. I got. I lost the call for a couple minutes, so I didn't okay. hear any of that. I just got. Yeah, the, the call was when you're working in in the summer and it's hot and humid. How do you really keep uh, the integrity of the fit uh, of an N95, for instance? 
Um, <clears throat> well, that's an issue. Fit testing really is the only way that you can tell whether the respirator is fitting or not. Um, I've worked myself in asbestos removal projects where I get it gets very hot and very sweaty, uh, and the respirator slips around on your face. Um, generally speaking, when your face gets more moist, it, it doesn't hurt to fit. It's just very uncomfortable. So I don't think there's a whole lot you can do about humidity and heat. It's just very, very uncomfortable, and it's very tempting to lift the respirator off your face and wipe it down or something like that, and, and there's nothing really wrong with doing that. Um, but it's mainly a matter of discomfort. All right. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Uh, there's rumors of, of false negatives of the tests up to one third. Um, there's also um, questions here about test availability. Is it getting better? Where are we at with that? So if you can answer that. Sure. The latter, the latter question uh, is, yeah, the tests are becoming more available and uh, we're doing, uh, you know, in the U.S. right now, there's probably 100,000 a day. Um, more are coming online. It's slow, uh, uh, but uh, and we have to work our way up to doing a million a day uh, for those that most need it. So there's a lot of prioritization uh, going on uh, with uh, with testing right now. All right. Um, so many here. I'm trying to combine them, but with higher injury rates within our occupation, things of that nature. What are some ideas that we can do um, just so we're not, so we're, we're pro providing proper protection for the workers? Is there anything that we haven't mentioned yet that would, that, that the attendees could use? Any thoughts there? Um, well, I, all I can do is reemphasize uh, how critically important is it is not to lose sight of safety issues as you're trying to take care of this new health issue. Um, you, you just, you know, all you're hearing is social distancing, distance, cleanliness, this, that, and the other thing. But don't, you cannot forget about things like fall protection, welding safety, uh, crushing, you know, impalement hazards. Those things reign supreme. And the health stuff comes after you've taken care of those issues. That's critically important. I, don't, I can't really say uh, anything other than that. All right. Um, this might be a question for the doctor. What about uh, if someone has an injury on the site that might include an open wound or open sores? Is that a way that this seems to get into the body also? If someone's injured, has a cut, anything of that nature? Um, probably not. You know, this is a respiratory virus, as we've emphasized, uh, spread primarily through respiratory droplets. Um, I think even if respiratory droplets were to fall into an open wound, uh, I'm not sure that the virus would survive very long because it needs to connect to the receptors on our respiratory tract cells. Uh, That said, um, if somebody gets injured, they need to be taken care of. And that, again, is uh, one of these priority things. You take care of the injury first. Protect yourself as much as you can while you're doing that. But depending on the severity of the issue uh, of the injury and the emergency nature of it, you know, you do what you can to make sure that the employee injured is taken care of. Um, that's the top priority. All right. Um, if, if the crew members working on a job site shows signs of coronavirus does the job need to be shut down everyone sent home what's kind of the protocol there if we believe there's someone on site with it well you know i'll start off but um i'm not an expert on on the, on the construction work site that that y'all work in most often um with regard to um the issues of in our workplace where we've had uh a uh covid a uh, uh, 19 positive case, um, we have uh, uh, imposed the isolation requirements of 14 days on them. Um, and then we've uh, decontaminated the work area that, they're, that they were in. Uh, in a construction site, it's I'm sure more challenging than, than decontaminating uh, a desktop and a cubicle. 
So I'll let uh, Lynn or Steve comment on how one would go about doing that. Um, I'm not sure that um, there's much that could be done in the way of decontamination, although it really does depend on the situation. Remember, there's shop work and there's field work. Uh, shop work, uh, decontaminating surfaces is going to be much, uh, much of an easier concept to deal with. You're not going to know necessarily every surface, but if you know of some, you want to take care of those. Um, also, there's a little bit of contact tracing uh, light here. Uh, you you want to talk to the worker and find out if he's been in close proximity to anybody else in the last day or two, day or three or four, um, just so those people can be appropriately warned. Um, again, you know, you don't, you never really know <laughs> whether what you're doing is going to make a difference, but there's a decent chance that it will if if you do if you take simple measures <laughs> like those. All right. Yes. Uh, please. Like, or go ahead, Steve. Yeah, please. And I think that would have to be a case by case issue, just as uh, Dr. Howard and Lynn said. Like for example, if we had 18 men and women ironworkers stuffed in one shack eating their lunch as fast as they could in 30 minutes, you you would know that there were and and say one or two of those people did in fact uh, <coughs> infected. That would cause us to to look deeper into everyone that was in that shack and, and do a deeper dive. But once again, it all depends on that particular situation, if and when we find out that somebody has been exposed. And I think that that's what the question was. Yeah. And I think, right. you know, if somebody's, if somebody's thinking about how to, um, how to have a good sort of protocol for worksite safety during the pandemic, Thinking in advance about these issues and having something roughed out uh, to guide you should something like that happen is a great idea and it would be a great thing for a, a training program. All right, we're running up against our two hour window here. So I'm basically going to ask one last question because it, it kind of piques my interest too. I'd like to know the doctor's thoughts <laughs> on this. Will this virus in the future, and you may not have an answer for this, but do you believe it will mutate? And are we going to be seeing more of these viruses, these pandemics, uh, staring, us, staring us in the face every year? What are your thoughts there? Well, I think there are two questions. Uh, the, the viral mutation question is all viruses mutate. You know, uh, this virus, like any other virus, uh, uh, it makes copies of itself within our own cells, uh, sometimes uh, tens of thousands uh, to millions of copies of itself. Uh, and it makes small changes uh, because RNA viruses are notoriously error prone. So there are always those types of things. And that's, for instance, as an example of influenza, uh, the strains change every year. So we, uh, if we're using the influenza model, we may expect that this virus, if it comes back in the winter, may be a little different. Uh, than it is right now. Uh, uh, hopefully it won't be uh, even more virulent than it is now. Maybe it'll be less. Uh, we don't know exactly what, what's going to go on there uh, in the future. Uh, we certainly hope to the second question that we don't have to go through uh, another pandemic like this. Uh, one of the issues that if you talk to uh, folks who specialize in this area, is the uh, prevalence of wet markets uh, where animals uh, from all sorts of different species are in the same close proximity where they would not be in the wild and they can exchange viruses, become an intermediary, and humans are also in that same environment. So I know that China is looking at uh, banning uh, so-called wet markets uh, to prevent this. So. Uh, we certainly hope that we don't have to go through another one of these. All right. Well, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your time. We have uh, Eric Dean wants to get on and say a few closing words, but I know there's a, still a lot of questions to be asked, but we've been on for two hours now, and I know you all have things you need to get on to. But I want to thank you for your time and this great information you shared with us. And, uh, Eric, I know you want to say a few things. If you'd like to go ahead, we'd love to hear from you. Oh, I just wanted to say, you know, you talked originally about the CARES Act not being able to answer those questions. We had a, some guidance put up on the IMPACT website. So for the employers and or our members, there's guidance, A, 
how unemployment is available, B, how you handle pay, paying uh, someone who may become sick on a job site. That's a whole nother subject. For the subject matter expertise, I tell you, I learned an awful lot today, and I learned about the virus, how it's distributed. But uh, most importantly, you learn enough from this information to be able to keep our members safe on the job, the ones who are working, and then keep your family safe. So I can't thank you enough. And Steve and Pete, as always, you know, these monthly calls, you keep changing the topic. This one is, this is a hot button issue, but uh, I think it was really well done and very informative. And I just want to thank everyone for taking and making the time. All right. And uh, Steve, you want to say anything in closing? Uh, just thanks again to Dr. Howard and to Lynn Wells for all their hope and uh, their, their help and uh, being friends of the iron workers. And I know that both of them are very, very high demand. Uh, they see probably dozens of phone calls every day from large associations and groups for their help on things like this. But they both took time out of their day uh, today uh, and are scheduled to, to work with us. So I want to thank both of you again. Okay. And thank you. Thank and, you, pleasure. And, and we look forward to, to seeing you again in the future. Thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. Everyone be safe out there, and uh, we will continue to have more information available as it, as it becomes uh, available to us. But be safe and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you.